you answer. May we also answer when you call out for us. And Lord, we know that in the evening hour, you have already sent forth an invitation for us to be in your presence. Where you said to us, come, bless the Lord. O oh, you servants of the Lord who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Night has come and we are standing in your house. Father, may we remain in your presence. May we not be in a haste to depart from your presence. Lord, let us recognize where we stand so that we are not hurrying out of your presence. O oh, King of Kings. Lord, we worship your holy name. For yet again tonight, Lord, we will hear your voice in our hearts and we will receive your word unto the churches that we may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, y'all be seated. God is good. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you. We we'll give you praise. We we'll give you praise. God is good. God is good. God is good. All right. Well, we have uh, parents here that are excited about school starting again tomorrow. God is good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, maybe not every parent because we have parents who also like just looking at their children all day. Where, whichever camp you're in, it is what it is. They are going back to school tomorrow and we're thankful to God for the privilege that we had of being able to pray for them on Saturday. Come on, is, I mean, was, was it Saturday? Yeah, we got to pray for them on Saturday. God is good and just so glad to see the, the children come up here and be prayed for. Now, today, by the grace of God, um, we would also take two testimonies in the, in the, in the course of the meeting. Um, I'm going to just uh, let you know how that goes, you know, as it is my custom. I don't mind sharing other people's testimonies. Yeah, I just love it. And, um, and some people actually ask me, you know, just ask me to do it. You know, sometimes it's because I, they know that if they don't, I may not be very happy. But I, I, I love rejoicing with those who rejoice. I love to be a witness to what God is doing in the lives of others. So I want to show us two things very quickly, two things that are related um, Spiritually, they are related geometrically. The symmetry of what I'm about to show you in terms of kingdom principle is one that enables for us to begin to introduce a balance into our lives when it comes to what I do and what God does. You know, because quite often we're in that um, in between and we're like, oh, where do I stop? Where does God start? And so let me show you very quickly uh, these two verses of Scripture, Ezra chapter 4. Uh, let's go to the book of Ezra. Ezra. And it's um, one of those books that you expect to find later in the Old Testament, but it turns out to be it is earlier in the New Testament. So we'll look at Ezra chapter 4, verse 12. I'm going to just give us time to Google it real quick for those of us who may not know where Ezra is. Please try not to look at anybody at this time. They're feeling judged already. And so, um, and, and then you might even find it on the board. I mean, on the screen. Oh, well, it is there already. Chapter 4, verse 12. God is good. All righty, so let's, let's go on and read. And this is what it says. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. What does it say? It says that these people are beginning to do certain things. I mean, the ones who are reporting the incident are the enemies of the work that the people of God are doing. And sometimes in life, the people who provide the most details about what you're doing are the enemies. And so let us not discount the place of those who constitute 
enemies in our lives. You know, when Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for them, it's because there is nothing any man has that he has not received from above. Everything means everything. So your friends are from God, and so are your enemies. And if you would love your friends who are from God and pray for them, why would you leave out your enemies? That means you don't accept them as having come from God. The reason why many of us come under more of a burden than heaven has actually um, assigned to us is because we want to pick and choose the categories of our blessings, whereas heaven says all good things come from the Father of light. And so if you do not recognize it as a good thing, that is when it can become an evil thing and a bad thing. I mean, look at the life of Jesus. Look at how difficult it would have been if Judas had not volunteered to betray him. Who knows, maybe even Peter would have been beaten also. But Jesus was so, I mean, God in his divine wisdom had it orchestrated such that there was a person that was close enough to Jesus to make the work of betrayal easy. And so here we are, the enemies of the work. If I let's read from verse 7. The Bible says in the days of Artaxerxes, also Bishlam, Misredath, Tabal, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So in the days of Artaxerxes, also Bishlam, Misredath, Tabel, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. You see, there's so many of them. That's why it was very detailed, the account that they gave. And the letter was written in Aramaic, in Aramaic script, and translated into the Aramaic language. Rehom, the commander of, and, and Shishmai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to king Artaxerxes, in this fashion, verse 9, from Rehom, the commander, Shishmai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, also known as representatives of the Dinites, the other word which no one knows how to pronounce, but I would try, Af- Afarsatites, the Tarpelites, the people of Persia, and Iraq, and Babylon, and Shushan, the Dehavites. <laughs> I like that name because it means like the ones who don't want you to have, the Dehavites. You know, the opposite of have is to de-have. The Dehavites, the Elamites. I like to call the Elamites the Alamites. They always send an alarm. They're Alamites. You have all of these enemies and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapar took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river and so forth. So these people have several enemies. This is a copy of the letter that is sent to him to the king Artaxerxes from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up here. Now, Like I told you, the object is to show you what you do and what God does, but I just find it very interesting that quite often the people that provide insight into heaven's position in your life may not necessarily be the seers in your life or the prophets in your life. It might be the enemies in your life. They are the ones who will take time to enumerate your blessings. They will take time to understudy your progress. They will take time to get all the details and the nuances of your journey because they are looking for ways by which they will catch you. I am personally thankful for the enemies of Jesus' ministry because imagine Jesus' ministry without the Pharisees and the Sadducees. A lot of the insight of heaven, a lot of the insights into the workings of the things of God that Jesus shared with his disciples was not as a result of the curiosity of those fishermen, but it was mostly in response to the opposition of the learned ones. 
Because imagine if the Pharisees had not come to challenge him on the issue of taxation, would we have received that divine insight into what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar? If the Sadducees had not come probing into the matters of resurrection and the afterlife, would we have heard things like in the world to come, y'all shall be like the angels of God, not marrying and giving in marriages. The disciples did not even care enough to ask those questions. And so when you look at it, we have been so blessed through the ministry of the enemies. That's why the Bible says God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Your enemies are so eager to see you fall that they will do whatever they think it takes. And there is no handy man like a willing man. When God was looking to increase the capacity of the life of Job, when God looked from heaven, he saw Job as a well. And like I told you once before, how do you increase the capacity of a well? You don't by making a wall around it. You do by taking out dirt from it. And so when God wanted to increase the capacity of the life of Job, because in reality, remember that in the order of righteousness, Job is one of those entities that was a shadow of the believer that is to come. And that was why Jesus said to the believers that were listening to him that out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. He went to the woman by the well and began to compare the well to himself. He says, you can drink from this well. You'll be thirsty again. But you see, this other well, when you drink from it, you will never thirst again. From God's perspective, you're a well. And the only way by which you can get the water from a well to be cooler and to be cleaner and to be more is to take out more dirt from the well. And the trouble we have with the dealings of God with us, as God increases the capacity of our lives in readiness for the fulfillment of destiny, is that he takes out the dirt. And that dirt for some of us is our foundation. And so whenever someone is taking out what you're standing on, you feel like the bottom has falling off from under you, and you feel like you're falling, whereas interestingly, you are growing. Praise the Lord. That is the reason why, Sister Barbara, it is important for us to see as God sees. And so when God was willing, when God was ready to increase the capacity of the life of Job, he started to take from Job that which Job had always held on to. Many of us are wells who hold on to the dirt because they think without the dirt we have no bottom, we have no standing, we have no foundation. But God is like, that is not your bottom, that is not your foundation, I am your foundation, I am that rock of ages. You can take everything out of a man as long as you have not taken out his God, that man is good and possibly even getting better. And so when God needed to do, or to, when God needed that dirty job done, it's called a dirty job because you're taking out dirt. He was looking for someone who would be willing to do it tirelessly. And so he said to Lucifer, what have you been up to? And Lucifer was like, to be honest, not, nothing. I've just been going to and fro upon the earth. I've just been faffing around. And the Lord was like, okay, well, I mean, you sound like uh, you can use some, <laughs> some assignment. Have you considered my servant Job? How there is none like him upon the earth. And Satan was like, Job, nah, he's no good. Satan presented himself as an enemy of Job. And God was like, I think we found ourselves a match. Because sometimes your friends can give excuses. Your friends, you can ask them to come and help you move and they will come up with a thousand and one stories of why they will not show up on that day. You've given your friend an opportunity to be a blessing to you and your friend is looking for any excuse or, and every excuse possible not to seize that opportunity. To ask someone to come and help you is to give them an opportunity to accrue for themselves points in heaven. Because the Bible says, do good to them that are of the household of faith. Good, do good to all men, especially to those of the household of faith. So when I give you an opportunity to come and do good, it's because I'm giving, heaven is presenting you an opportunity to accrue for yourselves stars that will never drop to the ground. But many people do not see it as an opportunity. They see it as a burden, and that is the reason why they chicken out and they make all kinds of excuses. You know, because 
The reality of it is that many of us would take the definition of a friend from the pages of worldly magazines as opposed to taking our definition of who a friend is from the word of God. The Bible describes a friend as that one that is born for adversity. The Bible says a friend loves at all times. You see, and so when you have an issue and you call out to somebody who is a friend, have we not experienced people who give excuses for not being there for us? And they tell themselves, oh, yeah, you have to be smart these days, otherwise people will use you. They'll take advantage of you. And if you think that is being smart, then I pray to God that you will have an opportunity to see what your account looks like in heaven. And when you see how much deficit is in your name because you keep making excuses and not seizing opportunities to pour into the lives of others, maybe then, well, not the people here, you watching online, maybe then you will wake up. Because again, the folks in here are always looking to outserve one another. I am thankful to God because I am surrounded by people who are always willing to outgive and outserve one another because we have come to know that it is more blessed to give than to receive. We have come to know what it means to actually be a friend in need because that is only when I can tell if you are a friend indeed. But I tell you what, your enemies are the exact opposite of your friends in such instances because while your friends may shy away from an opportunity to help you, your enemies are always looking for an opportunity to harm you. And so Satan was looking for every opportunity to hurt Job. And that was the reason why he was the perfect candidate for the job. He did not rest day and night. He was digging out the dirt because he thought the more he took out of Job's life, the emptier Job will be. But that was because he did not know that the way God designed the man Job, the more you take out of him, the bigger he became. And so here we are, knowing fully well that all of these people who were so happy to sign the petition against the people of God, they put down their names. They wrote it with the best, they, they, they sought out the most advanced liter, I mean, uh, literacy people of the time. Because remember, this was the time of Ezra. When anybody wrote in Aramaic in the time of Ezra, they were very sophisticated people. Because that language did not really become popular until the time of Jesus. And so around this time, it was the language of the elite. They took their time with all of that sophistication to be able to itemize the progress. And that is how we now know because of the ministry of the opposition, what God expects you to do in the grand scheme of things. So let's read that again. I will lay that as a foundation. The Bible says, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city. Well, they can say whatever they want, but we know what's really going on. The Bible says they are finishing its walls. They are what? Finishing its walls. Not beginning, but finishing. The Lord begins the walls, but he wants you to build on top of the wall of protection that he has in your life by building on it with your trust. God is not expecting you to trust in him for nothing. He already has a wall of protection around you, but how high that wall is, is a function of your trust in him. I want you to hold that thought. Let's go to that Matthew very quickly. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. I am thankful to God that I am a well. I am a well. Genesis I mean, sorry, Matthew. We could have even gone to Genesis. It's there too somewhere, but let's read from Matthew. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. Look at what it says. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, Then the Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? For just any reason. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning? So when I said that it is in Genesis, you see what I mean? Because 
the one who made them at the beginning is referring to what was done when he created them, made them male and female. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 to be precise. And the Bible says, reading on in verse 5, uh, in fact, let's quickly jump to verse 7. And the Bible says, they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? You see, <laughs> you see what God does. He does from where? From the beginning. Because he is the beginning and he is the end. And so we've read here once again the Pharisees coming to test Jesus with very difficult questions. Now the reason why this is very important is because I want to bring out to us as New Testament believers what we do and what God does. Is it because the folks in the Old Testament were required to do certain things because what God was doing was not yet finished? So they were still required to make sacrifices of animals because the lamb of God that was slain was the beginning of the sacrifice. It wasn't until it was on the cross that the sacrifice or the lamb was done bleeding out his life. And that was why Jesus only said it was finished at the cross. And so between that beginning and that end, the men of the Old Testament did certain things that were permissible for them to do. And I don't want you to remain caught in the activities of the old simply because it was permissible for them to do and now it is no longer beneficial for you to do. Paul said, all things are lawful unto me because I am no longer under the law, which means everything is now permissible. He said, but not all things are expedient. So they brought a question to Jesus to reveal that, wait a minute, you say God said, He's made them male and female and commanded that a man shall leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife or cleave unto his wife, a better word, and that the two of them will become one flesh. That was what God did. But this is what Moses told us that we can do. And why would they ignore what God has done to focus on what they can do? Simply because if you only rely on what God has done, then you can't take credit for anything. And there is something that is in, innate within us as fallen men that wants to take some of the glory and take some of the credit. If you are not aware of this, until we become fully aware of this, the enemy will continue to lurk within our thoughts, causing us to engage in actions that are only for the glory. There is a lot of stuff that we do that we do not because... We are led to do it, not because there is value in doing it, but we do it simply because we don't want God alone to take all the credit at the end of the day. At least I also did this. Someone is like, but uh, that's not me. Have you ever worried? If you've ever worried about anything, that's you. Because quite often we think that by worrying, and that was what Jesus said. Jesus looked at a cross section of men and he said to them, I know you people, you think that by your worrying you will add a cubit to your size and a span to your height. Because that's why we worry. We worry because, I mean, subconsciously within us, we think that is part of participation. You worry and you, you go out of your way to, 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 to try to make things happen. But there are things that God has laid down for you to do. He wants you to build on top of that wall. God wants you to trust. That's one of the things that he wants you to do. But now here we are, the religion in us, which is what the Pharisees represent, is stirring us, and is stirring us up to do things just because it might be somewhat permissible. And what did Jesus say to them? Jesus said to them, yeah, I know, that Moses said you can give a divorce certificate to your wife. And Jesus said, but if you must know, the reason why Moses said that was because of the hardness of your heart. What did Jesus tell the same people, the same Pharisees? He said to them, before Abraham was, I am. So all those times that Moses went on the mountain to meet with the Lord, guess who was there? 
Jesus was there. So when Moses went up to tell God, these people are, they're about to stone me because I'm not allowing them to divorce their wives, to put their wives away. Which, can we just talk about this for a moment? Do we have two minutes? When Jesus was talking about uh, giving divorce certificates, he was talking about two kinds of separations. You know, because the Bible says, whosoever puts his wife away, and while she's been put away and he is separate from her, if she goes to be with another man that is adultery, if he goes to be with another woman that is adultery, they were not yet divorced, they were just separated. Because what they were doing at the time was, they would say, well, I'm suspecting. So when they suspect whether the wife has been with somebody else, they will put her away so that they're not tempted to be with her, so that if she turns out being pregnant, they can tell that, okay, this must be someone else's child. And that is the reason why you are, the Bible says you are only allowed to put her away on the grounds of sexual immorality so that you can prove. You understand what I mean? Because they said only on the grounds of sexual immorality. If you suspect immorality or infidelity, you can stay away and she can stay away so that if at the end of the day nothing comes out of it, then okay, maybe nothing happened. That's the reason why the Bible says only on the grounds of immorality. And that's why the Bible says while y'all are separate, you're supposed to keep yourselves pure. You understand what I mean? But that was not enough for these boys. What these boys wanted was while they were putting their wives away as punishment and as, as a way of proving a point, they want to go and be with other women. And so they insisted that Moses give them a temporary certificate of separation. So that they can say, well, I, I mean, I gave her a certificate. Now I can knock myself out. I can hit the streets. And Moses said to them, he said, the reason why you're doing that is because of the hardness of your heart. God did not ordain for you to do it. Moses only permitted you because y'all were about to kill him. Because Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Until he became flesh, he was with the father. And so he was there at every one of those times that the father spoke because he is the word of God. And being the word of God, he was a witness to all of those happenings and he knew that poor Moses had no choice but to say what he said. Now the trouble with us is that a lot of what we practice or some of what we still practice is being practiced as a result of religion and religious practices that were introduced just so that people did not kill the men of God. We need to learn how to focus only on the things that are of significance. So now, let us go back to Ezra. And then let's break it down some more. In Ezra, the Bible says that they were what? Finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. The Bible says, if the foundations be faulty, what can the righteous do? Uh, so, of all the things that I have expectation for God to do, repairing foundations is mine to do. Now, what I mean by mine to do is that I need to learn how to bring those issues that I am being convicted about to the Lord and say, wow, I had kind of like shoved this one under the carpet, but I am bringing it to you today. Say, Lord, help to heal this brokenness. It is not yours to hide from God the things that you are standing on. Many of us are hiding things from God because we think it doesn't matter, but God is saying, I want you and I to partner on fixing this foundation. Let me give you an example of one of the things that God expects us to do, which we are meant to do, otherwise it will not be done. You see, many of us, while we were still learning how to trust God, we put certain measures in place. We put certain measures in place. And we did not even know that we opened certain doors. And those now constitute the foundation of your moral life, the foundation of your finances, and the foundation of your walk with God. Because while you were yet able to trust God for your finances, you had already teamed up with some CPA who knows how to twist numbers. 
And every time you're making financial plans, that is at the back of your mind, that worst case scenario, I'm just going to tell this guy to do what we do. Now, that is a faulty foundation. And now God has blessed you with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He has given to you all of what you would need, but you need to fix the foundations. Don't just build the walls. Fix the foundations. And how do you fix the foundation? By severing ties with anyone that encourages you to do evil all in the name of being smart. Sever the ties. Many people are believing God for a spouse. They believe in God for a spouse, but they're like, well, just in case this spouse is delayed and this flesh is not, I'm going to just keep that number handy because some days I may need somebody to scratch my back. The foundation of your future marriage is now faulty simply because your moral commitment has a loophole in it which is there for convenience. The Lord gave you a word, and that war is to protect your hope from failing by saying through the man of God that the man that the Lord has for you is coming. And God expects you to build on that wall because your responsibility is not to seek excuses like the Pharisees were alluding to Moses' divorce certificate. Your responsibility is to build on top of the wall Build on top of the wall of revelation, on the wall of promise, on the wall of protection, trust, profession of faith, and renewal of hope. That's what you're supposed to do. And once you're done building the wall, what do you do? You repair the foundations. You go back to what is the foundation of your fidelity, of your commitment, and your chastity, and make sure that there are no loopholes such as that number. For self-help. Let us know what God does and let us know what we do. God is faithful to his word. He said, he that will come will come and and he will not tarry. Though he tarries, the Lord says, wait for him. He will surely come. God is saying in your eyes, it might seem like the man is delaying. Your flesh may be telling you, if you don't call that dude today, we're dead. Tell your flesh, I am the resurrection and the life. If any man be in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. If even if I die, I will wake again simply because I die daily. We need to fix them foundations simply because God wants to give you more blessings. And when the foundations are faulty, it will not because it doesn't want you to be completely destroyed by those blessings. Because if you have a faulty foundation and God brings all of the blessings that you're asking for, When the blessing comes, the foundation begins to wobble and then the blessing crushes you and then the blessing is like, where is the lady that the Lord said? And the Bible says, when that happens, let another take his place. So I want to encourage you, do not make yourself a casualty of God's goodness. Make yourself always a beneficiary of God's grace by allowing yourself to build on the wall of God's providence by trusting in him day by day and fixing the foundations because you know what loopholes you have put in the foundation. The Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord with which he searches the inward part of his belly. So when God is searching those things that you have have hidden, he uses your own thoughts and consciousness to do it. Because you knew when you were saving that number. You knew when you were signing that contract. And God is saying, you can at least do that, right? Fix the foundation. Praise the Lord. When it comes to what we do and what God does, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Recognize what he has started and be confident that he will finish it. Your part is to do the work that is in the middle. The work of keeping yourself pure the work of expanding your territory, the work of making room for that blessing, the work of living by faith like someone who God, whom God has truly promised. That is your part to play. They were supposed to finish the wall and fix the foundations. 
Imagine if we can just focus on those things. Hardly would we ever go to bed tired. Hardly would we ever feel like throwing in the towel. The reason why we're frustrated sometimes and the reason why we want to give up is because while you were tired of waiting for God to bring that man, you found yourself one at the gas station and you're trying to make him into the man. Nothing can be more tiring than you trying to do the work of creating your own miracle. If, oh yeah, single woman, what, what did you say? You want to put your hand up? I can pray for you. But I tell you what, <laughs> be careful when you get prayed for as a single woman because the prayers may come in the form of promises that would require for you to wait for the promise I have to deliver. You see, because quite often when we receive these promises from God, we want to make it happen, and that is the reason why we get exhausted. That is the reason why we get tired. That is the reason why we get frustrated, because we are trying to make a piece of stone into gold. We are trying to baptize a dog, hoping that it will come out of priest. We need to leave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I think it's... <laughs> School starts tomorrow. Let's break bread. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Class is in session now. <laughs> Come on. I want you to say that I will wait on the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I am thankful for the wall that the Lord has started. I will build on it with my trust. I will build on it with hope and in hope. And I will let him finish what he started. I will be humble enough to expose the loopholes. And partner with him to fix the broken foundations. You remember that I said to you a while ago that there is nobody that God, will, that God turns away. The Bible says, God speaking, he says, whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast away. But if you don't come to him, you have already cast yourself away. So come to him with passions that seem too powerful for your will. And say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. The Bible says when my heart is overwhelmed, this was David speaking, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. There are certain times wherein your passions can come in like a flood and they want to overwhelm you. And you're like, oh, well, God sees that I, ha I have no power against his passion. And God is like, yeah, but I've also prepared a rock that is higher than you, and all you have to do is phone home, and we will come and help you. God does not want to badge into your little business, but when you invite him, he will come. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, this Jesus that is standing at the door, he holds the master key. He could have said, you know what, I'm coming in anyway. Nobody says, I stand at the door and knock. If you would let me, I would come in. And many of us are just not letting God into those areas because we think those areas of our lives, we, 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 got, it on the, we, 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 we got it locked down. The God, this is not part of our relationship. Me and you, we're only talking spiritual things. This is kind of like matters of, you know, just helping myself. And the Lord is saying, well, are you saying you are a help unto yourself or am I your help? He can help you in anything and with everything. I've seen people who know no mathematics become excellent in accounting simply because they ask God for the wisdom on how to manage resources. And so rather than save the number of some shady dude who helps you to, to, to defraud the system, just keep the number of that heavenly father that helps you to overcome at all times. It is about the same level of effort. It, it takes the same effort to call somebody that will help you to compromise as it does to call a God that will elevate you in righteousness. When you are pushed to the corner and when you seem to be overwhelmed by passion and emotions, instead of calling a man, call God. 
Because it says, when you call on my name, I will answer. It's just that some of us don't like the way that he answers. We don't like what he says. But when you don't like what your father is saying, is indicative of the fact that you still need to mature some more. Because you know, when we're children, we don't like a lot of the things that our father says. In fact, I didn't even mind as much what my father said, but what my mother says, you know, she used to tell me, you know, to, to, to plan my time better and, and make room to study. And I'm like, ain't nobody need that. I was in that class. I heard what they were saying. I can just give it back to them. I just want to play. But as I grew older, I recognized, in fact, sometimes I wish I could still have that kind of parenting, you know, wherein they're telling me what to do all the time. Because sometimes I'm, I ask my mother, I'm like, why didn't you remind me to do this? She's like, you're a grown man. You should do that yourself. You understand what I mean? But as we grow older, we appreciate. So I'm telling you that if God is telling you to do things and they don't sit well with you, just take that as an indicator of the need to mature some more. Rather than throwing tantrums and resisting and doing your own will, give in and do his will. We're going to break bread today from the book of Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11. And before we read Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11, I want to give us a quick insight. You see, the word of God in your hand comes in different shapes. And I'm going to explain that with another scripture. The Bible says that God, by the ministry of his word, is beautiful for every situation. And so it is important for you not to become religious about the leading of God in your life. Because there are certain times wherein you're in a situation that requires a square peg and God gave you one. And now that you're standing in front of a round hole, you still want to use the same square peg. Because that was what God gave you the last time. God does not expect you to build a tabernacle around previous experiences. He wants you to learn how to trust that he knows what is right for that situation so that you don't become a demigod unto yourself. So now let us look at Isaiah 55 verse 11 and then it will make more sense. Isaiah 55 11. The Bible says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. <laughs> you see, I've come here today by the grace of God to offer you some help. By the ministry of the Holy Ghost. You see what you just read. You may not know because for a long time I did not know either. God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. That means it shall return. So that word that he gave you, that brought you victory, has already returned. But you are still trying to use that same word. <laughs> if you are trying to use a word from God that has returned, you know what you're doing? You are carrying around an idol that is an image of something spiritual. And that is the reason why the Bible says God told the children of Israel repeatedly. He said, you shall not make any brazen image. You shall not make any idols for yourself, whether of things that I show you here or things that I show you in heaven. Make no image because God knows the danger of making an image. It keeps people locked in the past even after the cloud has moved into tomorrow. God has a fresh word for you today on exactly what to do. But you want to apply the word from yesterday. I say that today because there are so many of us that we are saddled to the past because we do not know that that word has returned. But God says, I have a fresh word all the time because the Spirit of God speaks expressly. If you don't know what God was comparing his word to here, read from verse 10. The Bible says, as rain comes from heaven. 
So is my word. And when it's raining, what happens is you see water come down, but more water is coming after the water that just came. So you don't just take the first drop of rain and you're like, that's it, I'm going to go water my field. You need that continuous stream. Because without that continuous stream, there is no enablement for fruitfulness. But many of us, we allow ourselves to be so easily saturated with one word. Because that one word has accomplished. Because God once told you, give only 1% of what you make from that business to help the poor or to help that ministry. And that was seven years ago and you're still giving only that 1%. Who knows how much more God wants to bless you. Do you know how many more people God wants you to reach that that 1% wouldn't, but you're still holding on to that 1% because you don't want to hear no more. It's convenient. I'm going to just stay here. Do you know that there are certain people that God told you, avoid that door, that door post. Don't go near that house for a season. And now that God knows that you are grown enough to be able to go and handle that situation. You're like, well, God told me not to go there, so I'm not going there. I'm not, I, I, I'm not talking. I don't talk to people like that. Uh, I don't do things like that. I, don't, I, I respect myself. And God is like, okay, but why don't you respect me? And do that which I say. I say that today to say to you that there is so much word from God that is being missed simply because we are carrying word idols that have already returned. Tabernacles around experiences that have already gone. And the Lord is saying, until you wake up to the need for a fresh Rima word, until you wake up and have that understanding that God has more for you, you will still be there waiting and applying a word that has fulfilled its purpose and returned. Some of us don't recognize that this word that we're talking about sometimes could look like a divine encounter. We don't know that sometimes this word can look like a vision, a dream. It can even look like a divine visitation because those are ways by which the word of God has been revealed to us in the past and God says, do not build a tabernacle around any one of those experiences. Wait for the next and look forward to the next because if you're not expecting, you cannot deliver. I thought Diamond would at least understand what I just said. If you're not expecting... What do we tell people who are pregnant? How do we describe them? We say she's expecting. If you're not expecting, John is not about to have a baby because he's not expecting. Yeah, but Diamond is expecting and that's why she's going to deliver. If we are not expecting to receive a word from God, if we don't have that expectation, nothing will be delivered to us. The Bible says in verse 11, be part of it but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So it's not God's fault that that word that he gave to you is not working for the thing that you send it because it was meant to work for the thing that God sent it. You understand what I'm saying? There was a time in my life that every year I doubled my offering. And I thought I was doing good and God was blessing me. And I, and I kept carrying that word over, carrying that word over. But after a while, I didn't hear God say it. So I was like, okay, maybe he's busy. He forgot. I'll just help him say it. And so I would double it. But God wanted me to do more than that. And so one day I was in a meeting and they asked for an offering. And I was like, yeah, I can handle this. I can just, you know, double what I gave the last time. And then the Lord showed to me that he had more for me than I was making room for. Of course, I wasn't happy because I heard what he said and it was several times what I wanted to give. I literally almost emptied my bank account to give that offering. I was going to the offering. You know, like as the Bible says, he that goes forth sowing and weeping, bearing precious seed. That was me. The seed was, you know when something is precious to you because you already made plans for it? I already made plans. Every, every amount of money had a name and a project and an assignment, a vacation. Everything was already planned. And then I was taken into the offering. They thought I was under the power of God. But in fact, I was really just struggling. 
to let go. I went away almost sorrowful. But let me tell you something. Because I heeded the voice of God that brought me a fresh word of God, things started to happen that immediately I knew that I, this is why it's happening. Simply because if you don't put seed in the ground and you just see a tree spring up, you'll be suspicious. You see a fruit that you don't recognize, you're like, man, that might not even be safe for a human. I'm not sure if I can eat it. But if I was the one who put the seed in the ground for that mango, I would be eating it all day. And that was what happened to me. I was able to seize opportunities in that next season because I had an expectation, knowing fully well that I put seed in the ground. That was a function of the word that came for what God sent it to do. I could have shortchanged myself by holding on to the last word. What do we need to do, folks? What we need to do is recognize that the Spirit of God is speaking expressly. What God is telling you now to do about this current situation might not be what he told you about the last situation. You are only trying to force the word to work. That one has accomplished what God sent it to do. Get a fresh word. And so as we break bread today, I want your heart to be open. In fact, you know, before I leave you today, I know there is a scripture. It exists. I can read it from Matthew, but we've read Matthew, but I'm going to read it from Genesis. Come with me to Genesis chapter 7. I, I believe this is a, a breaking bread scripture, and I'm going to be hanging my boots after this one um, for today. Genesis chapter 7. Look at what the Bible says in verse 17. I'm going to read verse 12, and then just jump to verse 17. Verse 12 says, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 17 says, now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose above the earth. Let me tell you something, folks. That rain came to fulfill the purpose. And that purpose was salvation. But imagine if, because you know that if the rain had not come and it started, if the rain had not become a flood, if it was just drizzling, the man would have broken down the ark. But God allowed for the rain to become a flood very quickly. The rate at which it was raining was not fast enough to have created a flood to raise the ark. Do you remember that? And so when God saw that that was not going to be enough, what did he do? He spoke to the waters of the great deep to also supply some water. Because he needed the man of God and his family to take off from the ground. He said, let the waters of the great deep give up their water also. Because I need this thing to take off from the ground. Now, that was what? That was salvation. Because it took them off the ground so that the spirit of death can operate underneath the water and take life out of the ones that have been made corrupt. So that the ones that the Lord wants to give rest to and bring rest through can be back on the ground. But the Bible says after a while, they needed to get out, which means that water needed to return. Let me tell you something, the same thing that was sent to lift you up, if you don't understand your seasons, it might also keep you away from your blessing. Because God was already doing great things on the ground. A new earth was emerging. But the water remained for 40 days and it was not going. In fact, the man of God had to pray. I said, God, what's going on? What is going on? This thing has served its purpose. And God was like, it, everything is timed. And when the time was fulfilled, that water returned to where it came from and dry land appeared again. It is very important for us to understand this secret, that when we, have had an ex when we have had an experience with God for a season that has brought us salvation, we should not stay there because God has more for you elsewhere. So let him lead you. Stop leading yourself. Let him lead you. And I pray that as we break bread today, that many hearts, in fact, that all of our hearts in here today, by the grace of God, will surrender to God and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Father, I need a fresh word. Whatever, wherever you lead, I will follow. Thank you for what your word has done in my life these 40 days. I am ready. 
for a new experience. I am ready for a new word. And let me tell you something. God will speak to your heart. He will open your eyes. You will, soon, you will see new things. You will sing new songs. So I want you to lay hold of the bread right now and the wine and let us partake of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. And just say, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice, for the privilege that we have, the life that you gave, even your glorified life. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Hallelujah. So one last thing before Alan comes to bless the offering and close out the service. This one is going to be very brief. I want you to just stretch forth your hands, everybody here today, and pray for my wife. And um, you see, a while ago, God gave her a revelation. And I was part of that revelation because I knew that it was time for her to make an impartation over several people. But you see, when God sends you somebody to give out virtues, to, to hand out blessings, but you yourself, you have not come into proximity enough by making a connection to that grace, you may miss out on it. And some people missed out on that blessing. Some people caught it. Some people missed out. But it was unfortunate that back then, majority of those who were supposed to have tapped into it missed out. Now, what I'm doing today is something that I am doing just because of the fact, I would say primarily because of the fact that I've seen it and because I know the value of it. There are blessings that this woman has secured on behalf of many in the place of intercession. And I know that that time has come for those that she has interceded for and prayed for to be called up to receive that which has been petitioned for. And as you pray for her today, I know that you are praying yourself into proximity and saying, Father, I thank you for this intercessor that you have raised. Thank you for the heart of intercession. Thank you for that which she has requested of heaven, that which she has secured by obedience for her brothers and sisters. Lord, may we not miss out of this experience, of these blessings. And so, Father, we thank you. Make it a prayer of thanksgiving. Because I don't think there's anybody standing here that has not been interceded for by this gift of God. And so when the time comes for the disbursement of the blessings, you will not be found wanting. That when the time comes from the, for the disbursement of blessing, you will still be in fellowship. That when the time comes for the disbursement of blessing, offense would not have driven you away, but you would have remained in fellowship that you may receive. Father, we thank you. Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You know, as, I was, as we were praying for her, the Lord showed you to me, Sister Z. Thank God for the general visions that you have had. And when I say general visions, God's shown you things that apply to the body. But you know already that a transition has begun wherein you will begin to see specific people. You understand what I mean? God will show you things about people specifically and you will, you will be right on the mark. In fact, when you go to them, you will not need them to confirm because it will be so clear to you. You understand what I mean? It will be so what? It will be so clear to you. So get ready for it. No, it's not going to freak you out because God prepared you for it, but I just want you to just be able to immediately hit the ground. You understand what I mean? That is coming. And one last thing that we're going to pray for is this. Let us thank God for the season that we're in and for the season that we're about to step into as a community of faith, as an household of God. Let us just give God thanks. You see, because... While Adam was sleeping, God was preparing Eve. <laughs> While it appeared as though we were asleep, God was preparing great and marvelous things for communion house. I wish it's been given to me to tell, but I know that this much I can say.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Bless his holy name. You see, let me tell you something. I started saying it on Saturday, but I knew that it wasn't time to go full-blown. When I kept singing that song in the mountain of his holiness, I told you that the Lord is elevating the mountain of his house in the range of mountains. The Lord is raising each and every one of us up as mountains in Zion. That means every valley experience that you have had that appears as though you are stuck in is about to become a thing of the past because the Lord is taking you high. You see, it's not just for the house so that you can say, oh, God is doing great things at communion house and then you look in the mirror at night and cry. No, when it is for the house, it is for everyone in the house. God bless you, Alan. Hallelujah. God is good. Let's prepare to give. Hallelujah. What a service tonight of encouragement. Part of this was sounding like a singles conference. Come on, he was tapping in. I thank God for this word because we can get so much in his presence. Just a few meetings ago, it sounded like a marriage conference. You see, we, we get so much here and we give God praise. Hallelujah. The giving details should be on the screen. Thank you, Brother Gavin. To our family online, those here, if you like to give, via Cash App, dollar sign, Communion House, at PayPal, at Communion House, as well as the Zelle, giving details there. Hallelujah. We'll wait just a few more seconds. And we'll give in faith tonight. Hallelujah. And let us be encouraged to just keep pressing in on our tithes and offerings, being consistent there because uh, we, even now I'm reminded of what we were encouraged in recently, that heaven is coming to pay out. It's coming to pay out, and we want to ensure that we're continuing to sow in this fertile ground what the Lord has given us here. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise yet again for this time of fellowship, O oh God, of encountering you tonight, of you speaking expressly, O oh God, through your prophet. There's none like you, O oh God. We thank you for ministering to us plainly, O oh God, in such a way that we can run with this, O oh God, and share it with others to be encouragement, to be light unto them, O oh God, in their dark places. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word, those things that we have captured tonight, fresh revelation, fresh insight into who you are and your plans for us. Lord, let these offerings be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling, O oh God, as we give in faith, as we give, O oh God, in expectation, as we give in obedience, O oh God, to what you called us to do. All glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen, hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. Don't forget, Wednesday night, 9 p.m., Instagram Live. We're continuing in prayer. Let's continue to see. Let's continue to be expectant with what the Lord is doing in this house. All righty? Everyone have a blessed night.